I have one minute after the hour. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stacy Smallfield. Dr. Smallfield is the Associate Program Director in the Division of Occupational Therapy Education, and she also is the capstone coordinator here. Dr. Smallfield has a national reputation for conducting systematic reviews and also practice, practice guidelines for our professional association, the American Occupational Therapy Association. So please welcome Dr. Smallfield, and I will turn it to you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I think I'll just go ahead and get started. Everyone can see everything okay, hear me okay? Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. So what I'm presenting today is the AOTA practice guidelines for adults with chronic conditions and a little bit how we can translate that evidence into practice. This is a presentation that I conducted earlier uh, this spring at our national, uh, our AOTA uh, annual meeting, which so you'll see the, the slide background and everything is, is pretty much straight from that conference. Um, really, the intent here is not just to present the findings from our uh, systematic reviews and practice guidelines, but really just also to maybe highlight a little bit of the process that goes into systematic reviews and practice guidelines, at least when working with our national association. And then um, I will try to also include a case study of how that information can be applied to practice. I do want to acknowledge I worked on this project with my co-author Beth Fields. She is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, she's not joining me here today, but uh, we worked very closely together to develop the practice guidelines. And I also want to acknowledge these individuals from AOTA, Deborah Lieberman, Susan Cahill, Beth Hunter, and Hillary Richardson, who we um, were, were in collaboration with very closely um, on the AOTA side of things to make sure we um, just had all of our ducks in a row and had access to external reviewers and all of those kinds of things. So you can go ahead and take a moment. There's probably not as many emoji selections here in Zoom, but if you had to pick an emoji to describe your comfort level or your just um, perceptions of using practice guidelines or systematic reviews to inform your practice, uh, you can go ahead and do that now if you'd like. I would suspect most of us would probably have pretty happy faces or smiley faces or things that, yes, that we love doing it, right? Um, and that is probably true for academics. It may not, it, this is something that not everyone out in practice is comfortable with, especially the people that um, have been maybe practicing longer and weren't exposed to tools and how to do this in practice. And so um, just something to be aware of, hopefully through the publication of practice guidelines and systematic reviews, we can make it easier for people to use this information in practice. So today uh, I am going to talk about the evidence for occupational therapy interventions for adults with chronic conditions and um, our lens, how, how occupational therapists um, view and approach adults with chronic conditions. And then in addition to the findings, we, I'll talk briefly about maybe where some of the evidence gaps are. So where, where we didn't find evidence, where we thought we either we thought we might, or we probably knew we might not, but still areas of research that needs to be done. We'll also talk about how to apply this to practice education and research. So that's pretty much my agenda today. I'm gonna to just give a little bit of background and then I'm gonna jump into some of our key findings and a little bit about those implications and then a case study. So a little bit of background about chronic conditions. We know that six in 10 adults in the United States uh, have chronic conditions. Four in 10 have two or more. Uh, it's the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Um, we know that chronic conditions are increasing and the prevalence and costs of them are also increasing. And uh, you know, risk factors for them include things like poor nutrition and sleep, tobacco use, use lack of physical activity and failure to attend annual health visits, um, 
So many adults with chronic disease experience disability. One way or one tool that we have to manage chronic conditions is through health management. Health management actually is, has taken on um, a new type of category in occupational therapy um, language. And so we've, we've kind of elevated the importance of managing our health, I would say, in the last few years. And a lot, a big part of that is teaching people how to self-manage their chronic conditions, which I think you'll see a lot of that come up in uh, the, the recommendations or the guidelines that have come out of this work. So in response to the need to um, address chronic health conditions, um, we've put together the practice guidelines. So really the purpose of the practice guideline is to increase understanding of OT's contribution in providing services to adults with chronic conditions. I do want to say here, it's, and this is an important point, um, AOTA has a number of, they, AOTA does systematic reviews and practice guidelines on a number of topics. And so the focus of this particular systematic, the systematic reviews that informed this practice guideline were on those that didn't already have that weren't already studied. So those that were included in this practice guideline are heart disease, chronic lung conditions, diabetes, and kidney disease. So things like um, stroke or arthritis or some of those things have their own practice guidelines in and of themselves. And so we're not included here. The one exception to this rule per se is in the area of caregivers, we did um, one of the systematic reviews that informed this practice guideline um, was around caregiver and caregiver support. And because that topic was not previously covered in the topic of stroke, um, people, um, caregivers of people with stroke were actually included in that portion of this work. In general, we, um, evidence-based practice, this is part of evidence-based practice, and we know that evidence-based practice is really a compilation or a, um, the middle of a Venn diagram, so to speak, of where we look at the best available evidence, what do we know from research combined with the preferences of our clients and the clinical experience and reasoning of, our, of the clinician who's using that information and working with the clients. There, um, oftentimes there's another, there's a fourth piece or circle to that Venn diagram, and that's the context in which you're working and how that matches the context of the evidence that we ha um, have to support our work. So I've referred already to the fact that there were systematic reviews that informed the development of the practice guideline. And so I'm listing those here. Um, there were four questions, and so you'll see that um, both Beth, each, um, Beth and I each were part of one of the systematic reviews, and then we take the findings from all four of the systematic reviews and compile them into um, the development of the practice guideline. So the four uh, systematic review questions were what is the evidence for the effectiveness of self-management interventions within the scope of OT practice for the performance of ADLs, which there's, I don't wanna, I know that we have a very interprofessional audience today. So ADLs is the activities of daily living, sleep and rest among community dwelling adults with chronic conditions. The second question was focused on instrumental activities of daily living. The third question was focused on um, the occupations of work, sorry, education, work, volunteering, leisure, and social participation. And then that fourth question was focused on caregiving for community adults with chronic conditions. So I, this slide here is just an example of, and it, it's not intended for you to, to read every little bit. I know the print is, is rather small here, but this is just an example of one of those systematic review questions, the process that 
that we go through to get to the articles that are included in a systematic review. So you'll see here, we start up at the identification phase. You'll see all of the databases that were searched to locate potential articles that would work to answer the questions. Um, we do some hand searching in addition to the database searching, and then we remove duplicates. Then we go to the screening process. The screening is really about just reading the titles and the abstracts to get the articles that then will go through a full review. And then at that stage, we determine the eligibility and which articles were included. So this particular um, prisma, uh, the flow diagram is a requirement for systematic reviews. And uh, this one is taken from the caregiver question that you saw on the previous slide. So we went from around uh, 9,500 articles that were screened to get to the final number um, of 102. Oh, I'm sorry, 102 were excluded. Um, the total number included in this, just for this particular question, were um, 48 articles that informed that. Then when we, in the systematic review process, every one of those articles gets screened. We extract um, common data points from every article and we give it a level of evidence, how much strength it contributes to answering the question. And we used uh, a version of um, Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine's um, level of evidence system, which you'll see on this slide. So systematic reviews of homogenous RCTs get a level 1A rating. So level one essentially is either a well-designed randomized controlled trial or a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. Level two evidence in our context here is any type of two group non-randomized study um, or a systematic review of that type of evidence or higher. Level three evidence is a one group pretest post test type of study or again, systematic review of several of those. And then there are level and four and five evidence as well. I actually think um, when we have levels one through three evidence, when we have enough of level one through three evidence, um, we don't typically include the level four and five evidence. When we review those, like in the case of the caregiver question, when we had the 48 articles, we theme those into um, common interventions. And then we look at how many articles support those interventions. And based on the number and quality of articles, like based on the level of evidence and the, um, what types of the findings there are and what the risks of bias were in each of those studies, we then, we theme them and we give them another grade. And so uh, we would give a strong grade to evidence. So a type of intervention that has two or more level one studies. So we need at least two systematic reviews that both are high quality, have minimal bias, and both are in support of that intervention in order to say that we have strong evidence to support an intervention. And um, likewise for moderate, we need at least one level one study or multiple moderate quality studies. So multiple studies at like a level two or a three in order to reach a moderate um, strength of evidence in our grading system. So today when I'm reporting out some of the key findings is everyone still with me? I, oh yeah, <laughs> you all froze on my screen for a second. So I was, had a moment of panic. Um, in just a moment, when I share our, our key recommendations, uh, you'll see me report the strong and moderate interventions. Um, and kind of, that's kind of where we're ending today. We could go on and on with others that have a little less evidence, but that's the results that you'll see today. And then this slide just shows of those four questions, systematic review questions that informed the development of the practice guideline. 
this is how the numbers broke out. Again, this includes no level four or five evidence. So of the four questions total, we had 102 articles that informed the development of the practice guideline. Um, almost half were, were at that level one um, rating and then level twos, there were 42 articles and level three um, articles. Again, level three is the one group pretest, post-test design. There were fewer of those at 10. So once all, all of those systematic reviews are completed, then this, the practice guideline development it goes, um, um, the, the systematic review authors get all of that information and we develop the guideline. Then AOTA staff review it and then it goes through a revision and then it goes out for content review and then another level of revisions. And um, it was published in AJOT. It goes through AJOT peer review as well. So another layer of review before it gets published. And it was just published, I believe in the April, April edition of AJOT. So with all of that said, a little bit of the background about how practice guidelines get developed I'm going to go now into what the key findings were in terms of what are our best strategies for assisting adults with chronic conditions um, with their um, performance of occupations. What I want you to listen to, this is kind of the boring part of the presentation, I'll just say, because I'm just talking about what the recommendations were. Um, there are, so I'm gonna give you a little heads up. There are 12 slides that have recommendations and what I would like you to do is listen to what the common themes are in, across all of the 12 recommendations. Where do you see that things that are maybe popping up uh, more than one time? So take a listen for those. The other thing I want to point out before I go to the next slide is um, I'm going to present them by systematic review questions. So they'll go in that order of activities of daily living then instrumental activities of daily living, then to the work and social participation, education, and those kinds of things. And then the caregiver um, evidence will be last. Um, and we've color coded them so that uh, you'll see if it's a green box around the recommendation, that's where we have strong evidence. And if we have a yellow box, that's where we have the moderate evidence. And both strong, I will say here, because I don't think it's necessarily so clear is that when we have either strong or moderate evidence supporting something, then um, clinically we, or practice wise, we do recommend offering it routinely to clients. In, in cases where we don't have either strong or moderate evidence. So maybe we have really low evidence or where the evidence is mixed. That's where we, then our clinical recommendation would be, you know, maybe try some other strategies first if we have other strategies at a higher level of evidence, um, but save those types of interventions for more of a case by case basis. Maybe when you've tried something and it hasn't been so successful, or if for whatever reason your client doesn't prefer to try something that maybe has more support, then you can go to some of those other interventions. So our first clinical recommendation is in the area of sleep. This is to enhance sleep for people with chronic conditions. The evidence says to use mind body self-care education for adults, specifically for those with heart disease, COPD, or those with at least one chronic disease. And mind-body self-care education includes sleep hygiene, nutrition, physical activity, and relaxation techniques. The dosage of that can range from six to seven weeks um, and can include a three-month follow-up and it can be administered either individually or in a group. Now, when we're looking at activities of daily living, so these are things like dressing, toileting, showering, grooming, those types of activities. Uh, we found in the literature specific recommendations to use foot self-care, foot care, self-management education, in addition to usual care for adults with diabetes. 
So again, the dosage and administration may vary. Um, it can, and these are some examples in the literature. There's a program that's nine months of texting. So that's text messaging, um, the tailored educational information, or you can have a four session health education program plus biweekly follow-up or a single, even a single in-person 15 minute educational session, significantly improved self-report and observed foot care behavior. So again, that's specific to the chronic condition of diabetes. Another clinical recommendation in the area of ADL, and this is a yellow box, so this is moderate evidence that supports a 12-week physical education program that includes aerobic exercise and resistant exer resistance exercise. And this is for adults with heart disease or COPD. And that type of intervention is for the outcome of improved ADL performance. Now we're moving to the category of instrumental activities of daily living. And so those are things like meal prep, house, man, um, house management, maybe community, getting out in the community, those kinds of things. So for adults with diabetes, um, we um, provide long duration group intervention of ed education, skill training, and a group process. So those types of interventions would improve HbA1c, self-monitored blood glucose level, diet, and physical activity. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful, right? So in terms of adults with diabetes, we're looking at providing those things, education, skill training, and a social support in terms of a group to enhance those outcomes. Another clinical recommendation in the IADL category is a, for adults with diabetes for short duration group intervention, including education and skill development, again, to improve HbA1c, um, blood glucose monitoring and dietary behavior. Another recommendation in that IADL category is again, with adults with diabetes, we should be providing individualized one-on-one -on -one interventions, which include self-management, skill training, and education to improve their diet and physical activity. And then moderate evidence supports self-management skill training and peer support for adults with asthma. This is um, a group, a combined group and in individual sessions. And that self-management and peer support improved, improve their forced vital capacity and understanding of peak flow monitoring to reduce asthma triggers. Another recommendation for that IADL category is for adults with chronic conditions to provide in-person or in-person with phone follow-up sessions that include goal setting, physical, a physical activity diary, and diagnosis education to improve physical activity, medication adherence, BMI, weight, and blood pressure. Now we're moving on to the third of our four systematic review questions. And this is specifically for um, what we can do to enhance leisure and social participation. So for adults with diabetes, provide multimodal intervention, including one-on-one -on -one health counseling and telephone follow-up and support, uh, support in a tailored health newsletter or an in-person and video instruction on problem solving, goal setting, and TheraBand exercises. And those interventions improve social or leisure participation. And then our last uh, set of clinical recommendations is around what, we, what occupational therapy can do to support caregivers. So for caregivers helping stroke survivors transition from acute care to home, the recommendation is to provide one three-hour training followed by seven 40-minute telephone calls or 
three individualized in-person sessions followed by seven weekly individual telephone sessions. That's a mouthful. Um, the focus of those interventions is on problem solving training using a multi-step strategy. And that is to address their most urgent problems and to improve caregiver depression. The next strategy in terms of what we can do to help caregivers, this has moderate evidence for adults, for caregivers of adults with chronic conditions provide eight weekly two hour sessions followed by 10 monthly two hour sessions or another study um, provided that intervention in 15 bi-monthly 90 minute group sessions. And the intervention focused on coping strategies, problem solving skills, and disease-specific education to improve depression and quality of life. And our last recommendation is for caregivers, for um, people with stroke, to provide three to five 45-minute sessions while in inpatient rehab with a follow-up home session, or you can the other dosage of that was three two to two and a half hour sessions during the hospital stay with three follow-up telephone sessions that include hands-on training in safe transfer and handling techniques to improve quality of life and reduce perceived burden. Well, that's a mouthful. So I'm gonna stop there for just a moment and open it up to everyone else. You can, you can either talk out loud, unmute, or type in the chat um, any themes that emerged in all of those recommendations. Are there common intervention strategies that are pretty consistent across those recommendations? This is Nancy. The one that impresses me the most is that each one of the intervention strategies includes education. Mm hmm Absolutely. That's definitely one of them. Any others? Hi, Stacey. Um, Hi, Kathy. There was a lot of them, but uh, one of the things that I noticed was um, education and training and problem-solving skills specifically, not just the skill, but problem-solving through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any others? I'll summarize that just a little bit. So a couple of takeaways from all of that is um, when we think about the interventions that OTs can provide, it's often multimodal. So it's not just doing one particular strategy, but it's doing more than one thing with your, you know, more than one strategy combined together with your clients. And those things, um, some of the key components are as both Nancy and Kathy identified, an educational component, problem solving strategies, and also goal setting. So having that, um, knowing what, what the patient wants to work toward and having that upfront and clearly communicated across the team. Okay. So now we get into a little bit more of the translating clinical recommendations into practice. So when we think of how can we take that information and put it into practice, these are a couple of questions that we need to think about as we do that. Um, the first one is exactly what intervention do I need to provide? And this is, this is where you need to really know what was, how well was the intervention described in the research study or in the literature that we have. You know, this is a real, in my mind, this is a real area for improvement, I would say, because a lot of our research literature devotes so little time to explaining what the intervention was that when we wanna translate it into practice, we don't always have enough information. And so um, do we have a clear understanding of what we need to do in practice based on what the study protocol was. Um, understanding what conditions your intervention will occur in. And this is that generalization in, uh, in terms of how um, the population that was studied and the environment in which they, the 
the intervention was provided in the study, how well does that match this, the patient population that you're working with? So they may have done it in an outpatient setting, but maybe you're working in inpatient rehab. Will it transfer, right? What, what are the key components um, of an intervention that might translate to a different setting if needed? So you're always thinking about, is it a match or is it a close enough match that it will um, have the same effect? And then how flexible is the intervention and how do I modify it? And can we modify it, right? Do we know the essential components of the intervention in order to um, apply it in our setting? I was OT, we talk about a black box. Oftentimes it's like, oh, we just did OT and we get this great, this whatever outcome, but well, what was the detail of OT that we did, right? Um, what's the secret sauce or what's in that black box? And can I, how, what parts of it are flexible that I could potentially change when I apply it in my setting and practice. So with that, <clears throat> I'm going to, to apply this information to a case. And I think for the, for the purposes of time, I would love to have a little more interaction, but I also want to um, not run out of time today because like all of you, um, we all have places to be at, at one o'clock today or even at 12, my goal is 12.50. So we'll, we'll talk about this case and we'll get some interaction as much as possible. So this is Salome and um, our case here is Salome who's a 60 year old woman with COPD. She also has CHF, obesity, hypertension and high cholesterol. And she lives with her partner, Jan in a two bedroom low income subsidized apartment. She has poor sleep and fatigues easily during a, um, IADLs. She had an exacerbation of her COPD and that resulted in an overnight stay in the hospital. She was recently discharged from the hospital and was referred to home health OT. When the OT did her evaluation, um, she, a little, this is a little bit of the information that the OT gathered. She's on one liter of oxygen via nasal cannula. Um, she does have difficulty managing that portable oxygen, especially when she leaves the apartment. She wakes early in the morning when Jan, her partner, returns home from overnight work. So Jan works the overnight shift. She comes home early in the morning and that wakes up Salome and then Salome can't get back to sleep. Um, Salome is unemployed and is on a fixed disability income. She's a previous smoker. So Salome no longer smokes, but Jan does continue to smoke, but she does it outside the apartment. Um, when, so we use a few different tools to evaluate Salome and you'll see some of those listed across the bottom of this slide. One tool that occupational therapists like to use to get a sense of, of how well a uh, client is performing particular occupations and how satisfied they are with their occupations. One tool is called the occupational Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. And when the therapist did that particular assessment tool, the goals that Salome identified that she wanted to work on were improving her sleep, improving her tolerance for activity, managing her own health, and getting out of the apartment more often. And when she ranked those on a scale of one to 10, uh, she averaged, she ranked herself. So self-report, she gave herself a three out of 10 average that those four things averaged together was a three out of 10 on how well she could do it right now. And a four of 10 of how satisfied she was with her ability to do those things. When the OT observed her perform occupations within her apartment, she was able to do them, but she needed lots of rest breaks. She needed, she was fatigued easily. She had to sit while performing lots of those tasks. Um, the OT did a depression screen and she was borderline for depression, a score of five on the geriatric depression screen and on a sleep tool, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, she scored a 19 of 21, which indicates a lower quality of sleep. 
So given that information, I want to talk briefly about algorithms and the use of algorithms in healthcare. So algorithm is a tool that can help us um, make decisions uh, regarding best practice right at the time of practice, um, right at the point of care. So they provide clini timely clinical decision support. It a lot helps practitioners adhere to practice guidelines for, to enhance our value-based care, and they can improve client outcomes, including health safety and satisfaction. So as part of our practice guidelines, we have developed there in the um, practice guideline publication, we actually have a couple of algorithms demonstrating how to think about using algorithms in our care, in our interventions that we provide. And again, I apologize, this is, um, has a lot of small type on this uh, slide. I can certainly get you the actual publication so you can see it in print, but this particular algorithm shows uh, kind of the thought process or a decision tree about what um, interventions to, we can use based on the practice guideline information that would pertain to this case. So in Salome's case, where she has decreased activity tolerance uh, and she has a COPD or cardiac diagnosis, we're looking, we can use this particular algor algorithm. So we start at the beginning and OT, we evaluate the client, right? Then based on that evaluation, we have to determine, does the client um, demonstrate decreased activity tolerance? And that's a yes or no. You make the decision. And in our case, she does have decreased activity tolerance. And so then we need to determine if the client has adequate problem solving skills to adjust her activity levels and modify her tasks, depending on her fluctuations or var variance in in her activity tolerance. Um, then in our algorithm here, her resp a response to that actually depends, then we're going to the evidence, but the evidence depends on if she has a diagnosis of COPD or a cardiac diagnosis. In her case, we have both. She has both those conditions. And so any of these interventions that are supported by the literature are things that an OT should be thinking about doing with that client. So that can be providing education to overcome impairment in ADLs, to increase physical training and encourage smoking cessation. Um, it's providing client education about self-management. It's providing behavioral intervention, motivational interviewing, follow, phone follow-up and text message prompts and providing education on aerobic and strengthening program. So one tool that uh, OT can use now in practice based on these practice guidelines are these algorithms that can be used at point of care um, in practice. So just a little bit more about the intervention then in addition to that activity tolerance um, intervention, some other strategies that the occupational therapist could use to, address, uh, to assist Salome with her identified goal areas um, fall into these categories, sleep and health management, self-management and education and problem solving. And I've just briefly described here things that uh, would fall under each of those broad categories. So our intervention sessions um, Salome was seen for nine scheduled sessions over two months of time, and we the OT used a multi-component approach to address the sleep and health management, um, which included education in sleep hygiene and a sleep routine. So uh, more detailed when you're thinking about that would be things like, you know, that disruption kind of in the early morning when her partner got home, how can you mitigate that and make that a smooth transition. So the OT worked with her to um, actually move to a different location in the house for sleep so they could sleep in separate areas and she wouldn't get woken in the night. Um, they also worked on mindfulness and relaxation. So when she did find herself getting a little more anxious, she had a, a, a strategy 
for um, reducing her anxiety. And they, they also worked together to establish a, a, root, a routine time to do her home exercise program so that she could do it more routinely as a, a part of her daily activity. In terms of self-management, the OT worked with Salome on an activity diary so that she could track when she was, which activities and which times of the day she had more energy and those kinds of things. So they created this activity diary. It also included an, uh, an item for identifying what her mood was at that time. So that could help the OT gauge the, the um, depression and those kinds of things. The OT followed um, her in between visits with a phone call to review that log and to figure out where her activities levels were at any given time of the day based on the activity log. And then the education and problem solving. This was particularly around the goal of the outings. And so they did some problem solving around what were the barriers to getting out into the community. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the portable oxygen tubing and having her partner Jan feel comfortable going out in public with that. So the OT did some problem solving strategies around that. So a little brief summary of the case. Um, essentially, the goals are met after the eight weeks. Um, there was in, she had increased satisfaction with her sleep. Her uh, we reduced the risk of depression because she was able to get engaged in the community more, doing uh, more outings with her partner. Um, we had set up meal meal delivery service to take some of those heavier tasks off her plate. And she was able to integrate an activity routine into her normal routine so that she had a little more increased tolerance for activity. So again, this case is meant to just be an example of how we can use those recommendations in, in practice. So I'll briefly touch on some strengths and limitations of the practice guideline in general. Um, some strengths included that it was um, the steps of the process were determined in advance and with a large number of knowledge users that were involved in the process of identifying first the systematic review questions, the keywords that were involved in the literature searches, the review of the content by content um, by OT experts, but also by people who have chronic conditions. Um, some of the limitations of the practice guideline, again, I talked about the narrow focus, how there are some chronic conditions that we didn't include because they are in other practice guidelines that AOTA develops. Um, there's always a chance for missed articles when you're doing a systematic review of this size. There can be human error and, and miss some articles and um, potential for bias there. We did identify gaps as part of the process. And so what do practitioners do when there is a gap in evidence, right? Where's, what do we do when we don't have literature to support our, the particular client we're working with? Um, so some of the things we need to ask ourselves is what, what do we do then? Um, some of the gaps that we found that we identified is that we have, lot, we have literature to say what OTs should do after someone has a chronic condition, but not always, how do you prevent the chronic condition from happening in the first place, right? And so I think that's definitely a need um, for more literature in the future and future research. Another gap that we identified is um, this idea around habit and routine. This is really where OTs shine, is integrating habit and routine um, integrating positive uh, self-management into daily habit and routine. And that always, that's not always clear in the literature because a lot of the interventions, when we do the, when we search for literature, we look for interventions within the scope of OT. And, and sometimes we know that our interprofessional colleagues do similar interventions. And so there's, it's not always that an OT is is the interventionist in the study. And so therefore this concept around healthy habits and routines isn't coming out as strongly as it could in the literature, um, which 
essentially we um, kind of means we would love to have more OTs as intervention or interventionists or as the researchers that are highly involved in the design of the studies. Um, Shared goal setting isn't as strong, so we know that goal setting is effective, but not a lot of information around inclusion of their care providers in that goal setting process. Um, ADLs and particularly medication management <clears throat> in the literature often gets, gets combined with IADLs. And so we would love to see in the future more information that teased out ADLs from IADLs in terms of outcome measures. And then in the young adult population. So this was a, a review of literature for adults and most of the literature is really in the older adult population. But we know lots of young adults have chronic conditions as well. And so we need more literature in that area. So I'm gonna wrap here by saying, <clears throat> Our conclusion of the practice guideline is that OT does have evidence to support uh, our ability to address self-management of chronic conditions from a holistic perspective. And really uh, the key suggestions are to use a multimodal approach that includes education, goal setting and problem solving components over an extended period of time to improve self-management. So with that, I think I am going to stop sharing and we have a few minutes where I can take questions. So I talked a lot now, hopefully, hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. Any questions or comments or Stacy, I just wondered um, how you guys feel you're doing in um, disseminating this way of looking at interventions to your larger group in the association mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people not in the association just we've yeah. experienced those issues ourselves yeah that's a great question you know I've I, as Nancy read in my bio, I've been a part of doing systematic reviews and practice guidelines for AOTA for a number of years, and none of them have been the same because they are always trying to advance, the especially the dissemination aspect. The first practice guidelines, I think the first three that I was involved in were published in books that you had to buy through AOTA, and who buys them, right? Like even the members weren't buying them, right? And at least now the last two that I've published have been in our journal. So if at least if you're an association member, you have free access to them. They're easily access, accessible by students now. So yes, it's, it's still not there in terms of it, it's peer reviewed, it's in a journal, it's all of that. I still think there's barriers there, um, but it's getting better in that regard. I think the algorithms, this, this particular practice guideline, I think is the one of the first two that include algorithms. So I think having that in, in as part of the practice guideline will help. The other piece that I'll touch on is that AOTA just finished a, um, their first trial of, and they're called echo sessions, and I'm going to mess it up. I don't even know all of the details. But echo sessions are, is, a, is a particular style of dissemination to practitioners. I believe the format is coming out of, oh, it's Oklahoma something. I don't know if it's Oklahoma University or, or exactly which university, but it's essentially a way to disseminate information to practitioners. And AOTA has adopted this. So they, um, sought out, so this was their pilot run, but they had um, about 30 practitioners sign up to attend four, um, four sessions held once a month to disseminate and on the topic of chronic conditions. And so these 30 practitioners hopped onto a Zoom call once a month to get this education. And um, Beth and I were, were Lead, led to the last um, two sessions. So the first two sessions were all about 
just be, um, kind of a review of some skills on data um, assessment, good evaluation tools, how to listen to the patients and those kinds of things. And then ha they had um, two sessions specifically on the findings from the chronic conditions practice guideline. So I will say we have a long way to go, but AOTA is trying of various methods. The echo sessions we disseminate at conference, they, they usually put the information in these one page infographics that they send out in their weekly email information. So it's getting there. We still have a ways to go, but those are some of the strategies that they're using. We're, clo we're close to time. I still have a question for you. Sure. Conducting reviews is very labor intensive. It takes a lot of people to do a lot of, lot of reviewing. What's the opportunity for students to be engaged in reviews? Yeah, I've um, almost always had students engaged in my reviews and I'm pretty passionate about that because I think students learn a lot by doing it. So even the very first one was a student, two master's students with me were published on an AJAD article after a systematic review process. I love mentoring students, walking them through this process of what are we looking for in the literature? And okay, do you, you we're gonna look through these articles, we're gonna come back and discuss them. Are they in or out? You know, and it's just a great opportunity to expose students to research to understand, like even if they never do another systematic review again, right? When they read the next one, when they read a systematic review or a practice guideline they're gonna know all of the labor intensity <laughs> that goes into it and have an appreciation that it's at your fingertips now instead of having to go look at those 48 articles individually, right? So um, every chance I get, I have students involved in the process. And in fact, next week, Tuesday morning, eight o'clock, two of the students are working with, are getting training with me on AOTA to start our next practice guideline updating the um, adults with dementia literature. So they will be very much a part of the process. Dr. Sue has also dropped a comment in the, yeah. in the chat box asking whether such important practice guidelines could be disseminated to a larger audience, such as through- I actually, that's, I'm working on my poster right now. That's one of the two posters I will be presenting in, well, maybe, in some form in our, at our World Federation in Paris in August. So we do try and take them up to the world level as well. Yeah, and I have um, done that several times in the past. Yeah, very good, Dr. great questions. Dr. Smallfield, I think we'll, we'll close so that people can get their short bio break before their next meeting. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.